Okay, well, finally, <laughs> with a slight delay, welcome everyone to our first meeting of 2023. I'm Judy Black. I'm one of the directors on the board of directors uh, for RAS Halifax Center, and I welcome you to our, our members meeting. Um, our website is halifax.rafs.ca. We also have a YouTube channel, which you can see all previous uh, members meetings and special presentations, GA presentations from 2015 and all sorts of other things. Uh, this meeting will be up in a few days on our website, so you can let the word out that if others have missed this meeting, they can certainly welcome to um, go onto the website and view it. If you have any questions about the center, you can certainly contact the president at that email address, or you can go to into contact us, and um, the email address is for other members of the board are also there, should you want to notify the secretary, the treasurer, uh, outreach, EPO, or whoever else you'd like to uh, contact. So feel free to do that. Okay, the first thing we like to acknowledge is the fact that we are on uh, the lands of the Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. Next, please. The other thing we'd like to note is that our center does abide by the uh, RASC inclusivity and diversity statement. All are welcomed regardless of age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, religion or belief, or sex and sexual orientation. And we are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. And that not only holds true for our center, but for all others across the country. Next, please. The agenda for today, certainly the welcome has been done. Uh, following a brief presentation of, included as part of the welcome is a photo montage by David Hoskin, our um, observing chair. We then have we're really thrilled today because for the first time in a long time, we've had something we call Youth Day. And we have two youth members, one here from Halifax Center and one from Victoria to join us and share with us their excitement in the projects they've been involved in. Uh, Silas Eastwood from our center and Nathan Hilner Masselman from Victoria. Uh, Paul Heath will provide his food for the soul in his poem called Toss High and I. And then Dave uh, Hoskin will be return with his What's Up in the January Skies. And in lieu of news from the board, we've included something called Christmas goodies, why there are concrete skies. Sort of a standing joke, as you know, that, all right, when we have several nights in a row of cloudy skies, okay, who bought something? Uh, and so we figured over Christmas, there were a lot of people that obviously bought equipment because we've had concrete skies for quite a while now. So we thought we'd offer the opportunity for members to uh, share what they did, in fact, get for Christmas this year. Okay, next please. For those that didn't attend the AGM on December the uh, second, third, sorry, um, the board of directors, as you see listed there, were elected. We welcome John Nangreaves as our new president. I know John is online. Uh, John, did you want to wave your hot hand or say a few words? You'll have to unmute yourself too, sir. Yeah. Um, also new to a role is Jamie Wynott as our treasurer. Greg Dill has stepped down in that role and Jamie has assumed it. So welcome, Jamie, and uh, thank you for stepping in. Uh, also welcome to the board as a new member is Tony McGrath. Uh, Tony, some of you, many of you must know Tony from his years as the SCO manager as well. And I believe he's been on the board in the past too. So he's not new to our center. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Two appointments have been made. Our honorary president, Mary Lou uh, Whitehorn, is honorary president until the end of 2024. And Dave Lane was appointed as our auditor uh, at the AGM. To be appointed at this upcoming meeting on the 10th for our board, normally, uh, just a word here, normally we meet before this meeting, but for various reasons, we couldn't get the group together. So we're we'll meeting this coming Tuesday. And at that time, we will be appointing those dear souls to those particular roles. 
Uh, just a, a note for those of you that are in the room, you will note that the library card is out for the first time since 2020. So woohoo, three years and, and counting. Um, and so um, the library card is in the room, but Jerry did want me to make note of the fact that the online system at this point is not working. He's been working for a bit to try and get that functioning. So be patient, it will be functioning at some point in the very near future. Yes. Ed from the chat, uh, our president, I guess, has technical issues of his own. He, his camera and therefore his microphone are not working. So ah, okay. uh, maybe he'll sort that out. Uh, maybe you want to try uh, try logging in from a cell phone or something that might work for you, uh, John. Thank you, Dave. Okay, next one, please. Okay, there are three reminders. There's only one up there because I want to draw your attention to it. Um, is our Nova notes the current issue that, uh, that um, Lisa Ann Fanning and John McPhee put out is currently online. You have until February the 18th to provide any articles, photographs, or whatever else you'd like to provide for the newsletter uh, to Lisa Ann and John at Nova Notes Editor at Halifax.rasp.ca. Um, the Current issue is chock full of information and lots of articles, interesting articles, everything from uh, John Reed's Spirit of Science, which describes uh, about this plane that uh, delivers texts and um, other school equipment to teachers and students in seven different countries. There's an article about Dave Chapman's book, uh, The Mig Ma Moons, uh, The Seasons of Big Moggy. Uh, and just as a matter of note, I know I didn't let you speak ahead of time, Dave. But Dave is here in the room today and does have his book available to individuals. So if you choose to purchase a book, it's 25. That's right. Uh, and Dave can. OK, uh, he has. Um, you and in the seven bird hunters. Yeah, so they are here for sale. And certainly for those of you out in Zoom land, if you want to purchase a book, contact Dave and, and he will certainly uh, see that you get one. Um, also, Dave Hoskins with the uh, Aristarchus Plateau. It's one of my favorite locations on the moon because it's such a, an intriguing place with the dark diamond there on that lighter uh, background of, of the uh, Mare. Photos galore from our members, as well as uh, something new that we implemented in the previous issue, which is the Puzzle Corner. Now, the first puzzle was on constellations. This issue had bright star names, and so there will be a third one in the upcoming issue, so stay tuned for that. The AGM reports are there and there's so much more. That was just a, a highlight on some of the things that are there. Click again, please. Thing is, oh, <laughs> I'm hiding it, but um, the Astro Image, whoop, nope, go back. That's, no, that's okay. Um, the Astro Imaging contest this past year was canceled due to the insufficient number of um, submissions that were made. However, uh, you can see part of a poppy there, and the reason I put a poppy there is because the deadline for submissions this year is on Remembrance Day. So hopefully that visual will twig something for the Astro Imagers that your photographs for the contest for 2023 are due on Remembrance Day. Okay. Also, the RASC Service Awards. Um, Robin Fort, who is the chair of the awards committee for the RASC, has extended the deadline for submissions to January 31st. So if any member or members wish to nominate someone for the service award, you have until January 31st to go online to our um, on the national site at the service award, fill in the online form, and then email it to Robin. And I'm sure the details are there for that. Okay, so those are the three. All right, thank next Dave, please. Also, the 2023 Observer's Calendar. I do have some in the room for those that are here. They are $25 a piece. For those of you out in Zoomland, um, they are still $25 a piece. You can uh, email the treasurer uh, with the $25 and let them know whether you want one or more calendars. And in the notes section, please include your name and uh, a mailing address that you want them mailed to. Or you can send check to that particular address along with the same information as to how many you want. Um, but it's simplest really to send to the treasurer. As soon as the treasurer gets the payment um, to date, Greg has been notifying me who's got them in my possession. Um, and as soon as I get it, they get out into the mail. So that system will continue with, with Jamie as treasurer now as well. 
although I'm not sure if that's been transferred over yet, but either way, it will be done. Okay, next, please. Uh, our upcoming dates. These are posted online, but there are the dates for the upcoming meetings for 2023. You'll note that there's sort of a, a later September date because the Saturday would be September 2nd, which is Labor Day weekend, and Thanksgiving, which is um, the Monday, October 9, which means October 7 would be their Thanksgiving weekend. That's why it's moved out to the 14th. But otherwise, it's the first Saturday of the month. And we'll let people know about our presentations. We've got some exciting uh, prospects uh, coming up. So we'll keep you posted on that. And if everything continues as it is now, we will continue to have in-person as well as Zoom um, meetings. Uh, click again, please. The other dates to remember are these. Uh, the Kedjman Kujik Dark Sky Weekend, which are the nights of August 11 to 13, and the uh, Nova East, which is the nights of August 18 to 20. And keep in mind, the new moon is on the 16th, right? So it's pretty much in between the two weekends. So they should both be good, provided we don't have concrete skies. Um, Peter Hurley and Tony Schellink are the chairpersons of the Dark Sky Preserve and work with the National Park to make the Dark Sky Weekend come to fruition. So I'm sure that as we get later into the year, we will hear more from them about that. And um, as of the night of the 10th, Chris Young will become the new Nova East chairperson. And so we will be hearing more from Chris and his Novi's planning committee as the year progresses as well, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, you can click off. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, next up is our observing um, chair, EPO. <laughs> but Dave will do our, our um, mo photo montage for the past, I guess, month or so. Um, so David, take it away. Hear me? All right. So um, this is these are photos taken by um, Rask Halifax members uh, in December, and uh, as you can see, uh, or as Judy mentioned, uh, the skies weren't great through December, uh, but a few of us did manage to get some images. So can you get the first image there? Yeah. So this is a uh, Jerry Black's. Um, eyepiece projection setup. So that was the only one Jerry submitted, I think. <laughs> so, but I thought it was worth putting out how, how uh, gets a nice uh, picture of some uh, uh, lunar features uh, on the uh, screen of his camera. Uh, next one. Uh, Michael Balshad, as uh, usual, um, has some nice pictures of uh, uh, celestial objects taken from his window. Uh, and this is some sunspots from early December please. And Michael was also busy uh, sketching uh, Mars during its close approach. Uh, got some really nice uh, features in, in this particular sketch. There, there were a, a couple really good nights for uh, Mars imaging, as, as you'll see in a bit. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, Dave Chapman's submission of uh, a comet, the uh, C2022ET or E3, uh, also known as ZTF, um, which is um, visible through a telescope uh, at this point, uh, and uh, may, um, some think, by the end of the month, be naked eye visible uh, at a dark sky site. Uh, Dave uh, took this with the uh, uh, telescope at, at the at DGO. Next, please. Um, this is Jupiter. Uh, Art Cole uh, got this shot during, uh, I think the scene must have been really good that night because he got a lot of nice detail on that uh, that image. Great red spot, front and center. Next, please. Uh, Jason Dane was uh, probably one of the few members who was able to actually see the uh, occultation of, of Mars by the moon. Uh, he was uh, in the US under clear skies on, on a trip. And he took this composite. Uh, you can see uh, the Mars approaching uh, the moon on the left and then uh, exiting from behind the moon uh, on the right. And if you look closely, there's there's even a little bit of detail visible on, on Mars, even so it was very sharp, but a good, good scene that night. Next, please. 
uh, Tim Doucette has been, uh, as, uh, as with many of us, uh, doing a lot of planetary imaging. And uh, here's uh, Jupiter and one of the Galilean moons and an image of Mars, the uh, North Polar ice cap. Uh, very prominent in Tim's image. Next, please. Uh, Tim also did some lunar imaging. This is uh, Aristarchus and Valis uh, Shotarai. Um, as Judy said, a, a favorite of hers and, and probably a favorite of, of many of us. Uh, very interesting part of the moon and uh, a lot of a lot of good texture detail in, in this picture. I don't know what telescope Tim used. I suspect he might have used his giant uh, Newtonian for it. Next, please. And another uh, lunar image from uh, Tim, uh, crater uh, Eratosthenes and Montes Apenninus. Uh, Tim recently took uh, delivery of uh, one of our former, actually one of our life members, uh, Joe Yurchison's six inch F12 astrophysics refractor. So if he's not using that for the moon, he should be. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, an awesome, uh, Awesome telescope. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't know if Tim's on, but uh, if he isn't, I'll uh, shoot him an email and ask him what, what he, uh, he used to take these pictures. Next, please. That's you. <laughs> uh, Lisa Ann uh, was uh, the second member that posted something that, and unfortunately, where Lisa Ann lives, uh, uh, the, the, Mars was not occulted by the moon. Uh, but she did get a very close conjunction. And she also got photobombed by uh, a jet, which is kind of a neat picture. So please, uh, Paul Gray, doing some planetary imaging, a uh, little, little different for Paul, uh, Jupiter on the left with the great red spot and an image of Mars. And uh, I, this area of the moon would seem to be of interest uh, both to Tim and myself. So uh, this is a wider view of the uh, Montes uh, Apenninus and uh, craters uh, along uh, uh, Mare Imbrium and, uh, and to the south. Next, please. And uh, Color image of the moon uh, oversaturated to, to show some of uh, the uh, um, color due to mineral deposits. And uh, I think this was my last image of uh, Mars uh, before the skies kind of clouded over more or less permanently in December. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, this is a picture, I'm not sure when I took it. Uh, Probably wasn't in December. It might have been the end of November, but I, I processed uh, this image of the Crab Nebula. Color shows up quite nicely. And uh, this is the 37 cluster in GC 2169. Uh, and uh, uh, some people see a 37. I can see a 37. Others see a shopping cart. Um, but it's it's a it's a nice little open cluster to to look for uh, in uh, Orion. Uh, Stays Lane here. I just wanted to comment that I personally really appreciate seeing clusters. I know there's a lot of people that, you know, there's not no huge amount of color nebula and whatever, but I know there's a few of our members that are starting to take clusters. Kathy's uh, Walker's mm -hmm. another one. And I personally appreciate seeing them. They're they're not photographed enough, so enough, and many of them have very beautiful star patterns and colors. Next one, please. Uh, this is the uh, a galaxy that I imaged, uh, I think at the start of the month, um, NGC 2407, also known as Caldwell 7. And uh, it has a, it looks like a miniature M33, um, kind of a, a, a nice, fun little galaxy to, to look at. And Blair, uh, uh, I don't think he actually, posted too much in the way of uh, new images, but this is a montage he put together of uh, his favorites from 2022. And you can see that Blair has been quite uh, quite busy. And uh, the, you notice on the left, the elephant trunk nebula, he's been experimenting with a uh, pseudo Hubble palette. Uh, 
during this processing. And, uh, and some planetary too. Uh, again, Blair uh, doesn't normally do planetary, but uh, he seems to be uh, getting lured into it. Um, Kathy's in, uh, busy with some uh, very faint and, and interesting objects. This is the um, Abel 3 Planetary Nebula. And next, please. And a montage of uh, some of Kathy's images from 2022. Um, lots of, of really nice uh, long exposure uh, images. Uh, some of the uh, Squid uh, Nebula, which is uh, three down, uh, third row, is uh, really, really neat. That's that one, I forget how many hours of, of uh, imaging that took, but it was a, it was a lot. I think it was like ten or twelve at the at the least. And I believe that's the last one, Dave. was asked uh, where the photos came from, and uh, I took most of them off the uh, RASC uh, Facebook page, RASC Halifax Facebook page, and uh, a few people post on the discussion list, uh, Michael in particular, uh, and uh, Jerry and, and Paul sometimes, so I always uh, go through those and, and save them as well. Thanks, David, for that. Take my mask down for a moment. Um, the next part of our meeting is our youth day. In inviting these two young men to our, our meeting, it really was a thrill. Uh, and especially after I asked them for their autobiographies and you read them, you go, oh my glory. And these young guys are how old? Uh, they've accomplished more in their young lives than some of us in this room. Uh, you often wonder how RASC is going to survive with the next generation and will it survive with the next generation? And I think after you hear these two youngsters speak, you'll know that we are in very good hands with the next generation coming up through the RASC. Um, we have our two speakers are on the two coasts. We have our own here from Halifax Center and our second speaker will be addressing us from Victoria Center. But first, let me introduce our local gentleman, Silas Eastwood. He's a Halifax youth member, and he corrected me, he's in grade 11, not 10 as I initially had him on, on the website, and I apologize for that. Silas, um, he's at Citadel High. He enjoys chess, rock climbing, and swimming. He competes in chess tournaments and math contests, and he loves math and science and anything space related. He was honored with the Discovery Center's Youth Award for the second year in a row. He participates in science fairs and has been fortunate enough to represent Nova Scotia for the past two years at the Canada-wide Science Fair. His entries have won gold medals, excellent in astronomy awards, and the Youth Can Innovate, Innovate Award. In 2022, this past year, he was winner of the RASC Intermediate Prize in Astronomy for his project Smarten, simulated microgravity and reduced friction test environment for nanosatellites. I had to look that up because I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Uh, because of his science fair projects, he was invited to work with the Dalhousie Space System Labs on their Loris CubeSat program, which has recently been deployed from the ISS and is now in orbit. So that's quite exciting. And I'm going to quote Silas here. He says, it's important to be passionate about the things you do. The work can be challenging and frustrating, but if you truly love the subject, it can be the most rewarding thing ever. So Silas, we look forward to your presentation and we join, invite you to join us on the stage to address here to Leo and back, the promise and perils of CubeSat. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, I'm not familiar with this. Okay, so um, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to address the members of the RASC and participate in Youth Day. Um, so I, obviously I was invited here today because I was a fortunate recipient of the RASC Prize in Astronomy at the Canada Wide Science Fair in 2021 and 2022. And I thought you might be interested in learning a little bit about those projects. 
So I have had my love for science ever since I can really remember. My mom is a is a maths professor and my dad is a software engineer. So I guess it really just runs in the family. <laughs> Our vacations always included trips to museums, science centers, and locations where we could explore the world around us. Some of my favorites were fossil hunting, boiling eggs in volcanic hot springs, climbing on ancient basalt, and spelunking. You can go to the next slide. Um, so my interest in space in particular, sorry, yeah. my interest in space in particular was fostered by my parents. Countless times, my mom or dad excitedly he would call me to come look outside at a supermoon, follow a lunar eclipse, or watch a meteor shower. We even went down to Dalhousie to watch the partial solar eclipse in 2017. But my, and my own excitement about space really began at the 2019 Canada-wide Science Fair in Fredericton. They had science and technology. They had a science and technology expo, and one of the exhibits was from the U UNB's Violet CubeSat program. I was hooked. The idea that a small group of people, or even an, an individual, could explore space fascinated me. I decided to learn everything I could about them. You can go to the next slide. CubeSats are small satellites that because of their standard features and off-the-shelf components have greatly lowered the cost of doing space research. This has made CubeSats popular among organizations with limited budgets. For example, university space research programs. They, these programs are invaluable because they provide opportunities for improved education, new types of research, and accelerated innovation. You can go to the next slide. However, the failure rate of university-led CubeSat missions is extremely high nearly 50%, and a large portion of these failures could have been prevented with proper testing before launch. You can go to the next. Existing space simulators, such as drop towers, parabolic flights, neutral buoyancy pools, and air bearing systems do exist and can test space devices before launch, but these systems are expensive, have long wait times, can be difficult to access, don't provide much time for testing, and weren't designed for use with small satellites. In fact, most CubeSats never undergo any simulator testing. Some use FlatSat testing, where components are integrated on the benchtop to ensure compatibility between subsystems, but mission operations testing is generally not possible. So I decided to address this problem by creating a space simulator tailored for CubeSats. Smartin. Simulated microgravity and reduced friction test environment for nanosatellites. To closely simulate space, the satellite needs to be able to move freely in all three rotational directions with minimum disturbances due to gravity or friction. You can go to the next slide. So, with inspiration drawn from fun park rides, science center exhibits, and arcade games, I designed and built a device that creates the unconstrained rotational freedom and low friction environment that CubeSats experience in space. You can go to the next slide. So the device consists of a rotor, a spherical container that holds the CubeSat, and the stator, which creates a thin film of air on which the rotor rides. This stable cushion of air is produced through the combination of three key components. A hemispherical surface perforated with a dense mesh of equally spaced holes providing an even distribution of air. A plenum chamber that creates a positive static pressure providing equal pressure to each of the holes in the surface and a high volume, low pressure fan as the air source. Surprisingly, I hadn't yet heard of, let alone researched, spherical air bearings. You can go to the next slide. But this was basically what I had just created. Spherical air bearings use high pressure gas forced through tiny holes in the bearing surface to create an extremely thin layer of air on which a test fixture floats. But in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't know about them at this point. Some of my design choices, like the bearing surface configuration, the plenum chamber, low pressure fan, to in choice of materials, help me avoid many shortcomings of commercial spherical air bearings and bypass obstacles specific to the testing of CubeSats. Go to the next slide. I now needed to figure out how to minimize the effects of gravity, that is to create a microgravity environment. I realized that I could simulate microgravity by removing the rotational torques due to gravity. This can be achieved by making the center of rotation of the rotor and the center of mass of the CubeSat the same. If everything is balanced in all three axes, gravity will act equally on all parts and no rotation will occur. 
Let me go to the next slide. So I now needed a way to hold the CubeSat inside the rotor and position it so its center of mass and the rotor center of rotation were the same. I decided to use a cubical framework to hold the CubeSat inside the rotor. By making the framework fit precisely, the alignment process was greatly simplified because their centers of rotation would already be the same. I would only have to get the center of mass of the CubeSat to match the center of rotation of the framework. Here I took cues from my 3D printer's ability to accurately position its extruder in three dimensions. My, you can actually stand up. My satellite support framework uses three independently adjustable slides to provide three translational degrees of freedom. By manually rotating finely threaded rods, the slides can move along their respective axes. This allows the mounted CubeSat to be precisely positioned anywhere within the volume of the framework. I now needed to determine the center of mass of the support framework with its mounted CubeSat. To do this, I built a mass balance table. Like an electronic bathroom scale, load sensors are placed on each corner to determine the weight of the object placed on the scale. However, while a bathroom scale uses the sum of sensor measurements and reports the total weight, a balance table uses the differences between the sensor measurements that, and uses that to indicate the offset in the object's center of mass. The table can then report the adjustments necessary to move the object to a balanced position. Let me go to the next. So once, actually, sorry, no. So once the center of mass of the CubeSat within the framework is set using the mass balance table, the rotational torques due to gravity should be eliminated. Simulation of the weightless environment that a CubeSat would experience in space should now be possible, but I needed to test this. After extensive testing, it was determined that Smarten was able to decrease the effects of gravity by more than 11 times and reduce frictional torque to a level similar to commercial airbags. Additionally, it was demonstrated that Smarten could provide an environment where the CubeSat can be operated in a flight equivalent state. This is critical to the identification and correction of many conditions that lead to mission failure. By providing small organizations an easily accessible solution to the problem of pre-launch testing, Smarten can help enhance mission success and support continued exploration of space and our understanding of the universe. My second project was a reaction mail. In the summer of 2020, I was invited to participate in the Dalhousie Space Systems Lab's CubeSat project, Floris. I was part of the Attitude Determination and Control System team tasked with designing a reaction wheel for the CubeSat. A reaction wheel is a component that gives a CubeSat the ability to stabilize and orient itself quickly and precisely. It is typically made up of a disc that spins called a flywheel and an electric motor that powers it. Can go to the next one. So the spinning flywheel generates angular momentum, providing a rotational force on the rest of the satellite. Okay. So when designing a reaction wheel, factors that have to be considered include cost, materials, longevity, and assembly, which involves trade-offs and compromise. For example, in the case of reaction wheels, everyone wants more momentum storage, but increasing storage comes at the cost of increased flywheel mass or size in a container that has limited mass and volume. Go to the next slide. So during my time with DSSL, I created a series of five prototype wheels, each modified in response to issues and concerns encountered during evaluation. My final result is an alternative design that is low cost and easy to fabricate and assemble and is adaptable to many mission objectives. Okay. So this was accomplished by using three novel approaches. So the first is the use of a cantilevered flywheel support, and this allows the wheel to maximize momentum storage. Second, by employing a flexible axle insert, I minimized any unwanted forces due to imbalance and misalignment. And third, I embedded an optical sensor into the enclosure to provide simplified speed control. And you can go next. So all of the components of my reaction wheel underwent testing and analysis to determine whether the wheel met mission requirements and was space ready. This analysis involved a series of tests on the individual components and a working prototype. So as you can see, the prototype wheel performs extremely well, but this was expected because it was designed with these specifications in mind. 
However, it also compare, compares favorably with the commercial reaction meals as well, but at a much lower cost. And you can go next. So I'd like to mention some news about DSSL's CubeSat. Loris was launched from the ISS on December 29th and is currently in low Earth orbit. Initial contact was made on December 31st, but they are experiencing some anomalies and hope to have that resolved shortly. Now, while I, I thoroughly enjoy these projects, and the CubeSat platform is a remarkable tool, it provides invaluable hands-on educational opportunities, collaboration among different disciplines with unique ideas, skills, and perspectives, and novel research due to low cost and quicker development. But as with many marvelous technologies, there can be pitfalls as well, and CubeSats are no exception. While research-oriented CubeSat missions are a tiny percentage of the objects in space, the real threat comes in the form of mega constellations. Examples would be Starlink or OneWeb. These companies plan to put out tens of thousands of satellites in orbit over the coming years, and there are few regulations involving CubeSat-class spacecraft. There is no requirement to be able to deorbit on command, which will inevitably contribute to space junk once their lifespan is reached. In addition, CubeSats have no requirement to employ beacons for tracking or means to maneuver to avoid collisions, increasing the chance that they become hazardous debris. CubeSats also use radio frequencies that are near the frequencies used in radio astronomy, confusing radio observations. But the most concerning is light pollution. Satellites, especially those in low Earth orbit, are extremely bright, and their impact is already being felt. At Palomar Observatory in San Diego, California, 18% of their images they took in 2021 contained light streaks caused by artificial satellites. Just two years earlier, it was 0.5%. Now, there are remedies. Non-reflective coatings, higher orbits, sunshades, and pointing maneuvers can help, but there are no requirements for companies to employ these methods right now. I believe light mitigation should be part of satellite design and I'm hoping that my future science fair projects can address some of these issues. So humanity evolved looking up at the night sky, inspiring awe and wonder. The night sky is our window to the universe. Dark and quiet skies are a natural resource and should be protected. Thank you. So much. I'll have you hang on to your microphone. Uh, we're open to questions now. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat session. So those of you out in Zoom land, if you have a question, uh, put it through the chat or unmute yourself, uh, put up your hand and, uh, and we will address it that way. Uh, otherwise, hands up in the room if anyone has a question. And there's one right there, Paul. Well, well, Hello, uh, uh, I'm Paul. Um, what you designed to test the CubeSat, has that been patented? Uh, no, no, that's not. I've, I've approached the Dalhousie Space System Lab uh, for interest in application for testing of future satellites with their uh, association with Galaxia. But, and so they plan to use it in the future, but there's no look towards patent. Yeah, because that would fund your further research. <laughs> But that that's an awesome development for your for your for your age. That's phenomenal. Really congratulations. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I noticed in your tables you compared cost to your cost and then estimates or guesses, because in one case I think you said they were reluctant to tell you what they would charge for the for the commercial equivalent. Um, clearly, that's only the materials cost, not the labor associated. So I'm sure if you bought, so the comparison may not be apples and apples. Uh, it's you're not paying for your time. It's the actual manufacturing of like the components needed, mm -hmm. like the CNC for the wheels, that is included as the price for both in materials and production. The assembly process would needed to be would need to be done regardless because you still need to 
or you like it, it's very in, yeah just three hundred dollars set in today's world doesn't sound like a whole lot of you know that's sort of like you know one amazon order and you're done right so yeah um it's, i'm curious about lifetime because lifetime and things like mechanical systems that spin a lot yeah so that's a great question and and the truth is that a lot of these commercial grade reaction wheels are typically designed for larger satellites or satellites with much longer lifespans yeah and that's the really important thing is that cubesats typically have lifespans between one to two years yeah. and so these are designed for up to like 15 years it's not necessary for a cubesat so the wheels I've designed can last up to two, maybe three years with motor specifications under constant use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're obviously limited probably more by power. You, you can't run them very much because you don't have the power to be able to do that. Uh, so in some ways you're limited because you've got only have so much solar capacity to be able to do anything beyond run the computer that makes it work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any, no questions through the online. Any other further questions from the room? Okay. Well, Silas, thank you so much. This was really intriguing, and congratulations on the on the win with this project. I can see why you won, um, and uh, we wish you well in your future endeavors in this. So, thank you. Okay. All right, our next speaker um, is not joining us in person. He's joining us all the way out from Victoria uh, Center. I met Nathan, um, in essence, bumping into him per se in Gathertown at the GA when he was presenting part of what he's gonna to present today um, to people in Gathertown. And it was, so intriguing because the vast majority of us got the answers to his questions wrong. So we'll see what happens today when he presents some of that, that project. Nathan Des Helner Masselman describes himself as a 15 year old astronom sorry, astronomy enthusiast in grade 10. Uh, I went online to see uh, about this dear soul and he's been involved in astronomy for most of his life quite early in his in his age. He first, sorry, the lights in here. <laughs> um, also, Nathan, uh, although being only 15 years old, is also one of the three members from his center to be on the National Council. He's involved in Victoria Center's outreach endeavors and as well as those of the Cosmic Generation, which is a multinational astronomy group that he co-founded He's published astronomy articles in Sky News Magazine and Skies Up Magazine. He recently began producing a film on music series on the immensity of the universe, which is part of this presentation. And in his presentation description, he wrote, and I will quote it, we go about our daily lives with the perception that the earth is everything there is. In both space and time, the cosmos is ridiculously enormous. In, the present, in this presentation, we'll unveil the true magnitude of the universe, the unimaginable size, the future timeline, and where we find ourselves on this moat of dust floating through it. The future of the universe is a mysterious timeline full of mind-bending weirdness. Similarly, the size of the objects out there are equally hard to grasp. So Nathan, can you please Inform us, what is our place in the cosmos? Well, I would say, uh, first of all, um, that it is really impossible to ascribe a place in the cosmos, given that when we, will, when we look out in all directions, everything looks completely uniform on the largest scales, and there appears to be no center uh, to the universe. So we can certainly point out our location relative to other objects in space, but our place in the cosmos might be a mystery forever. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me here. And I look forward to blowing all of your minds. Um, so um, 
Should I uh, share my screen? Uh, with yes, please. I was just going to ask you if you could share your screen. All right. Yes, Ed. Hi, Silas. It's Dave. I'm the kind of tech guy here. Uh, uh, just before you start, just give us a moment to make sure that uh, your presentation appears on the screen. At the right. so I, which is currently is not happening. So I see your shared screen on my laptop, but now I have to get it on the uh, front projection. So just give me one moment here. Okay, I think that's that's. Good. You should be able to go ahead. All right, cool. And I suppose the subtitle here is a bit of a misnomer because by the end of this, I hope you're all convinced that there is really no way to grasp where the heck we are. But, you know, it's worth a shot. So, um, yeah, this is sort of my fascination with the universe. Um, I've sort of been um, intrigued by the just the biggest picture possible, which is leaving uh, our planet, our solar system, our entire galaxy behind, and just looking from like the deep view about where we are. And it, you know, you do kind of feel stuck by the end on this little planet, but then again, there's no limit to the human imagination. And that, that's something that I really love about our species. So I wanna start with a little disclaimer. Um, nobody here is possibly gonna understand this lecture, nor myself. And it's not because I'm a bad presenter, it's just because the human mind is not capable of grasping the immensity of the universe. So um, I certainly can't comprehend anything in this presentation. Um, if you can, there are several Nobel prizes waiting for you. Um, however, just be content that we are motes of dust uh, amidst the universe. Uh, and with that, Please enjoy this cosmic ride unifying three major fields in astronomy, which is astrobiology, the search for life beyond the earth uh, and the science of finding and sustaining it, astrophysics, which is searching for patterns and laws in space and the fundamental forces of the universe. And lastly, cosmology, which is literally borderline astronomical philosophy um, studied by theoretical cosmologists but I'd like to point out that the cosmologists themselves are real. Their title, however, is theoretical. Um, so I don't intend to give existential crises to anyone during this presentation. Um, I just hope it gives you uh, something fascinating to ponder. Um, but as a little bit of a waiver, let's just say I'm not held responsible for any existential crises that result from this. Um, so, one of the first things that I'd like to do is point out just how small we really are. I don't think there's any good way to do this because it is literally impossible to grasp how small we are. But one of the ways that I like to sort of give a little bit of comprehension uh, is instead of comparing it in abstract units like meters or light years that just stop meaning something at some point, um, I like to show it in units of objects. And we can start with the earth, which is around 7 million people wide, which when you think about it, isn't that much because there are 8 billion people uh, on this planet, which means if we all um, formed a long chain of people, uh, we could extend over a thousand times wider than our entire planet. Now the solar system is just out to Neptune's orbit over a million earths wide. Um, and that's just out to Neptune. The entire solar system extends over a thousand times farther beyond Neptune's orbit because there's a cloud of comets, the Oort cloud, and that marks the true end of the solar system, the beginning of the stellar neighborhood, which is almost 40,000 solar systems wide. Um, and yet our local stellar neighborhood is just a small part of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, over 2,400 times bigger. And as you can see, we've only filled up half the space available here. So um, it's gonna get a lot bigger now. The local group of galaxies is over 90 Milky Way galaxies wide. I like that astronomers had the audacity to call it the local group of galaxies as if there's something inherently local about something 
90 uh, or 9 million uh, light years wide. Um, I guess that's just what they do in astronomy. Um, everything just is so unimaginably big. Now the Virgo supercluster is 11 local groups wide. And that is only a small part of the Laniakea supercluster, um, which is three Virgo superclusters wide. And all that accounts for only 0.0000001% of the entire observable universe, which is almost 400 times wider. Now, as you can see, there's really no way to properly comprehend how small we are here but hopefully this just puts things in more comprehensible units of size. Um, don't worry, just, just take it as a uh, fact that we are unimaginably small. To reinforce this fact, I'd like to point out uh, a little trick that I like to call the hold your thumb up to the sky experiment. Um, so if you hold your thumb up to the sky, I don't know if it's cloudy there or not, um, but just even if it's daytime, um, there's still a whole bunch of stuff behind the sky. So if you hold your thumb up to the sky, think about what is actually behind your thumb in the cosmic image. And that would be 20 million galaxies covered up by your thumb, uh, containing uh, 96 quintillion stars, close to 500 quintillion planets. And I believe that is um, 3.8 Quinvigintillion, I, I, if, if the name of that number serves me right, um, cubic meters of space. Uh, it is just incomprehensible and that's all behind your thumb. I seem to remember um, there was a quote during the Apollo missions that said, if you held your thumb out from the moon, you could hide the earth. Um, well, if you, hum, it, sorry, if you, uh, if you hold your thumb out uh, from the earth, you can block out 20 million galaxies, which, which I think is a little one up from the Apollo programs. Now I wanna point out that the fastest speed in the entire universe is fast enough to reach the International Space Station in 1 30th of a millisecond and the moon in a little over one second. However, it's also unimaginably slow when you go beyond our local outer space neighborhood. It takes three minutes to reach Mars, which is far faster than any mission we've ever sent so far and frankly will ever send. But to Proxima Centauri, the closest exoplanet, it takes 4.1 years for light to reach it, which means if we look at Proxima Centauri, we're seeing it as it was 4.1 years in the past. If you went to Proxima Centauri B and looked back at the Earth, you would literally not know that the COVID pandemic had ever existed. And if you went to the Andromeda galaxy, you would not even know that humanity existed. If there are uh, civilizations in the Andromeda galaxy studying the Milky Way, they will literally not know of our existence because our light has not yet had time to reach them. And in fact, light from human civilization has not even reached the other end of our own Milky Way galaxy. So in our own galaxy, it's not even possible to know about our existence from the other end because our light has not yet reached them. Um, hopefully that just points out how big our galaxy is and how big the distances between galaxies are. Uh, the objects out there in other galaxies are just incomprehensibly huge. And in fact, the largest single object that we've ever discovered is Tun 618, which is a ultramassive black hole called ultramassive because they didn't think that supermassive black holes really gave them fair credit. Uh, the size of this thing really is incomprehensible. Our entire solar system is dwarfed by a factor of 30 times. Uh, this black hole is 300 billion kilometers wide. It has the mass of an entire small galaxy and it's visible to the naked eye on a good night from 18 billion light years away. Hopefully that just puts that thing in perspective. Um, so I wanna also point out that we put uh, this term up, down, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, we seem to have the impression that up and down were defined by the axes of our planet, north and south, or by the vector of gravity, uh, whether you're pointing towards it or away from it. But in fact, in the cosmos, there is no up and down. And when you think you're sitting still, from another perspective, you might be moving incomprehensibly fast. So I just want to point this out, that we're in... Um, 
sorry, I did this presentation in Victoria. You're in Halifax, roughly the same latitude. So this works out just fine, actually. You're also moving at around 300 meters per second, tilted at around 41 degrees um, from the Earth's axis. And the Earth is tilted at a further 23 degrees, uh, moving at 30 kilometers a second. Um, when in fact, the solar system is tilted at 60 degrees from the galactic plane, also moving almost 10 times faster at 200 kilometers a second. Um, that is fast enough to cross the entire length of Canada in about 30 seconds. And in fact, the Milky Way is tilted at a further 90 degrees from the supergalactic plane, moving three times as fast as 600 kilometers a second, which is fast enough to cross Canada in 10 seconds. Hopefully this just puts uh, our velocity in perspective because given uh, that I started this presentation um, around 10 minutes ago, we've already traveled, uh, what would it be, um, several dozen times the length of our planet. So when I like when people say I went back to the place that I was born or I went back to the place that you know we got married or something. And I'm like, no, you're not. That place is billions of kilometers away by now. Um, your path through space kind of looks like this, uh, and it's a never-ending winding pathway, um, and you're moving at hypersonic speeds every day, all the time, even if you're lying on the couch. Um, so one of the greatest astronomical quotes ever said was by Carl Sagan, who uh, said that we are made of star stuff. And that might sound like some slogan that astronomers just use these days, but it's more real um, than we tend to think about because we are made of elements other than hydrogen and helium, I hope. Um, for example, um, metal. There is no place in the universe that metal can be formed except in the core of a star as it explodes. Um, now that means we are made of the guts of exploded stars, which I don't really know how I feel about that. Um, but it certainly provides a better story to how babies are made than the conventional story. Uh, it all began in the core of a supergiant star as it exploded. How's that? And in fact, if I have kids one day, I'm going to tell them that that is how babies are made. Sounds a lot cooler, in my opinion. Um, so space and time, the very structure of space and time are unimaginably strange. And they may seem like normal things at the human perspective, like we are time traveling through time at a standard rate of one second per second. And you can move through space as fast as you want up to the speed of light. But if you approach the speed of light, space and time literally break down in unimaginably strange ways. Notably, if you travel at near the speed of light, photons from behind you start to enter your eyes from the sides, meaning you can literally see from behind the back of your head and your vision becomes like a fisheye lens. Time slows down drastically because your path through space time is distorted which means from your perspective, you can watch years go by in the outside world in a matter of seconds. Due to the Terrell effect, um, which is that light from the opposite end of an object can fall behind the object and become visible. If you move it near the speed of light, objects literally become distorted and you can see their front, back, top, bottom, left and right all at the same time. If someone passed you at near the speed of light, you could see their face and the back of their head simultaneously. And objects become blue shifted in front of you, making your forward vision a bright blue and your backward vision a dim red. You become more massive since your energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And as your energy increases by a factor of 10 quadrillion approximately, your mass increases by a factor of one, which doesn't sound like a huge ratio, but at near the speed of light, you have such a ludicrous amount of energy. Your mass increases by a substantial amount. And perhaps my favorite, as you rotate through space-time, if you move closer together in time, as in time slows down, you also move closer together in space and you literally become a human pancake. And this leads to a very strange paradox called the ladder paradox, which I'll just bringing up in a moment, which is that from your point of view, the whole universe is flattened like a pancake, but from the universe's point of view, you are flattened like a pancake. So this paradox is that 
you could conceivably fit a ladder that's too long to fit in a barn inside the barn if you're moving fast enough because you'll be flattened into a pancake. But from your point of view, the barn will be flattened into a pancake and you will not be able to fit the ladder in. So this is seemingly a paradox. It's not actually a paradox because events literally happen at different times. So your whole perception of time gets broken down, which means this is not actually a paradox, but it's still incomprehensibly weird. To add to the weirdness, space and time may just be a simulation. Um, there's no way of testing this. However, some have speculated that we are living in a simulated realm programmed by an advanced civilization. And that might sound like a conspiracy theory, but some have speculated that the speed of light is like the lag time uh, in a simulation or that the Planck length, the smallest unit of space is like a pixel size. I won't go further on this since this is highly unscientific and it's just a mind blowing speculation. But if we wanna think about the structure of space time, we can begin to think that mass, as Einstein formulated, can bend space time. Um, due to general relativity, if something is massive enough, it can pull and tug on space time. And that has led some speculations um, to lead to the fact that the universe may be curved in upon itself, like a sphere, of which we are living on the three dimensional surface. So picture this we are living on the flat, three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional hypersphere. From our point of view, everything looks normal. But if you travel long enough, you will eventually loop back, go in a full circle, and come back right where you ended up. Additionally, depending on the strength of dark energy, um, the universe could be bent into a four-dimensional saddle with negative curvature, which means if you fire two laser beams in a straight line, they'll eventually curve away from each other. Or the universe may just go on flat forever, meaning we are living on a practical flat sheet of paper in the third dimension. Uh, and whatever the sh uh, shape of the universe is, we are curved right along with it, so we have no way of knowing. Um, we do have ways of testing it, though, theoretically. Like I said, if you fire two laser beams, they will eventually curve away from each other or curve toward each other, depending on the curvature of the universe. And if the universe were a small enough hypersphere, light would eventually curve all the way around and come right back to where it started. So if you guys with your astrophotography are ever doing some observing one night and you see a little copy of Earth in the distance, and then see another little copy of Earth in the distance, and then you see another little copy of Earth in the distance, um, well, congratulations, we're living on the three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional hypersphere. Um, one of the most mind-blowing facts I found about the universe is that uh, space contains matter which has positive energy, and gravity, on the other hand, uh, contains negative energy, and those energies exactly cancel each other out. So x plus negative x equals zero, which means the universe is just a fancy version of nothing. In addition to that, the universe may go on forever, or it may not, and it may exist forever, or it may not. And we have no way of knowing this, really. But no matter which of these realities it turns out to be, there are mind-blowing consequences. If the universe has an end and an edge, as in it will not exist forever, and it does not go on forever, the question immediately becomes, what's beyond the edge? Is it possible to have a finite universe without an edge, because if you have an edge, clearly there's something beyond that edge. That was one of the uh, um, Greek philosophies from um, like many millennia ago. So um, one of the possibilities, uh, if you have a universe that is finite, but it still goes on forever, is if I go back here, uh, this hypersphere theory, you can go on traveling onward forever, and yet, this universe is still finite. You just keep traveling around in circles. That is, in my opinion, the least exciting version of the universe. Now, if the universe goes on forever, that means all possible events are happening all the time. No matter how small the probability is, if you have an infinite amount of space, it is guaranteed to be happening right now. And in fact, it's guaranteed to be happening an infinite amount of times right now. Every single event you could possibly imagine is happening somewhere in the universe right now. Every version of your life is happening somewhere in the universe right now. And that 
just kind of puts our civilization in perspective. Uh, if there are other versions of human civilization out there, which there are in an infinite universe, well, really, we're just one of the many versions of our reality in this infinite universe. And that, in my opinion, definitely qualifies as a mind blower scenario. Um, there are only so many ways your particles can be arranged. You can be reformed into a great deal of other things if we rearrange your particles. There are, in fact, 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 70 possible arrangements of your particles, but it is not infinite, which means if you go on for trillions and trillions, more than trillions, Google plexes of light years, you will eventually find copies of you, doppelgangers of you, just out of your own probability, which is really, really mind boggling. Likewise, just as mind boggling is the speculation that the universe will continue to expand forever. In fact, this is the most likely outcome of our universe given our current understanding of dark energy. The universe is less likely to undergo a big rip scenario and less likely to undergo a big crunch, more likely just to expand forever. And that means in a very short amount of time in the cosmic picture, things get very, very bleak. The sun will burn out, the stars will burn out, the white dwarfs will burn out, and galaxies will fly apart all in a blink of an eye in the cosmic timeline. Um, in an estimated decillion years or so, give or take a few thousand percent, because we really don't know how this is going to play out, uh, protons are speculated to actually break down, which means if there are still civilizations going on, they will begin to fall apart. Their very matter will begin to break down. And black holes themselves will begin to decay away thanks to Hawking radiation uh, occurring just outside the event horizon, which means that black holes will get smaller and smaller until they explode. If protons do not decay, all matter will eventually break down into solid iron. And after an unimaginable amount of time, so long you could basically call it an eternity, they will explode and then there will be nothing left. Kind of sad, right? But in fact, empty space isn't so empty after all because it's full of random quantum fluctuations, particles suddenly appearing and disappearing at random. And if you wait long enough, just by random chance, random particle fluctuations should generate, coincidentally, an exact copy of our universe, unimaginably far in the future estimated this long in the future, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, this is 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 56 years in the future, which is incomprehensibly far in the future, but it is not forever, which means eventually it has to happen. Eventually an exact copy of our universe is speculated to exist with exact copies of us. And those copies will never know that we existed in their past. And this raises an even freakier speculation, which is that we are those copies and that so many years ago, we've already existed, but we don't know about those because we think we're the originals. This is getting into uh, more philosophical concepts than astronomical. But the thing I like about this is that it's still based on scientific concepts, which means it's uh, stranger than science fiction. It's science fact, science speculation. And to finish this off, I'd like to start with, um, sorry, I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to finish with the most mind bending speculation of all which is that when you consider quantum fluctuations, these random particle fluctuations that could give rise to an, an identical copy of our universe. Well, our universe is pretty complicated. Um, I'll grant you that it's certainly more complicated than I'd be able to comprehend. Um, a human brain though, is a little bit less complicated than an entire universe. I hope you'll agree with me there. Um, all the stars, galaxies, planets in the universe, they're immensely complicated, but a human brain is a fairly straightforward thing, which means it's more likely for a single human brain to just pop into existence than an entire universe. So actually, it's statistically likely that our universe never came into existence in the first place, and that it was all just a single human brain imagining that it was living in an imaginary universe on an imaginary planet called Earth, attending an imaginary Rask Halifax Center presentation. And with that, I would like to bring this back down to earth with uh, some uplifting notes. Um, 
the human brain is literally just a human, um, it's a kilogram sized loaf of meat. But as astronomers, we are able to comp, uh, comp uh, sorry, uh, contemplate uh, the entire universe. And that's, that's really special in my opinion, uh, that we being so small in the cosmic image can comprehend the cosmos. And as Carl Sagan said, uh, if you're an astronomer, you are the universe appreciating itself. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. And as Arthur C. Clarke put it, either we are alone in the universe or we aren't. And both outcomes are equally terrifying. But if we are alone in the universe, we are the torch of life, carrying ourselves forward, being able to comprehend the amazing, uh, spectacular uh, nature of the universe. And most of all, we are made of star stuff. So with that uplifting note, I would like to say thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope this adequately blew your minds. Um, and yeah, this this has been my fascination for the last year or two and arguably for most of my life. So yeah, thanks so much for having me. Wow. Um, thank you, Nathan. Um, uh, yes, you did truly blow our minds. I'll, I'll say that up in front for many of us in the room. Um, I open the floor for questions at this point. Uh, any from the room or we'll keep tabs on the chat uh, as well from Zoom land if anyone has a question for Nathan. Ah, start here and we'll go up the room. I'm on now. Okay. Okay. Thanks again. Um, I'm just wondering if that largest object that you could see visually is it a quasar or something like that? How does it? What what type of object would we normally think of it as? Plot, plot, uh, plot well, plot. yeah. By usual standards, if it's even fair to call that object normal, uh, it is a quasar, and it fits into the category of hyperluminous quasar, um, which is the most extreme object in the entire universe. Uh, it is also the one of the brightest objects in the universe. Uh, every 45 minutes, it outputs the energy that our sun will emit over its entire 10 billion year lifespan, uh, if that helps to put it in perspective. Okay, is it visible in the Northern hemisphere or do we have to travel south to see it? Or do you know where it, you know where it is in the real sky? Um, I believe it exists within the I mean, alpha blob, but I don't know exactly which constellation it is in. I guess we all have homework. <laughs> <laughs> Canis Banatashi is what someone in the room is saying. The hunting, dogs. the hunting dogs. Yeah, okay. So it is in the Northern Hemisphere then. Yeah, I guess we all have homework. Uh, second comment is my dad said to me when I was your age that he, and he would have to arrange an operation to get the couch off my back. So now that explains that it really would have made no difference. My emotion would not have changed significantly if I was removed from the couch. I think I'll use that too. That's very good. Thank you. You're in the room. Is it coming through now? Thank you. Sorry, uh, yes. <laughs> sorry, Nathan. Um, I just want to say thank you for uh, joining us, not from your couch, but from your chair in Victoria. Um, and that uh, we're going to be traveling through space and seeing it sooner than you will. And But hopefully we will see you again here in Halifax Center. So thank you. I look forward to being there. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Paul Heath is up next. Um, so thank you. Um, next up is our resident, well, who I refer to as our resident poet, Paul Heath, who every month uh, provides us with another edition of his Food for the Soul. 
So we're going to have to hang on for a moment while our folks switch things up. And I'll pass this in the interim, I'll pass the mic over to Paul. Hello, uh, again, uh, Food for the Soul. Uh, just for uh, Silas and, and Nathan's benefit, Food for the Soul poems originated when I was president. And what I wanted to try to do was incorporate the talks of the evening and, and make astronomers and, and the other members that were at the meetings look at the science in a little bit different fashion. So more so of how the science that we discussed, oh, am I not on? You're coming Oh, yeah. but uh, try to make the poem relate to the two the topics of the evening. So it would make people look at the topics in a little different fashion. So that's basically where the poems originate from. So based on your two talks, this is sort of my uh, impression of what what they say. Toss high an eye within a hand crafted thoughtfully with care. An eye to see nature's tug between land and sea. Within a hand with purpose planned. An eye to show man's careless touch upon the land and sea. Toss high this thoughtful eye to seek the health of our land and sea. To show man's thoughtless twist of nature's hand upon her land and sea. Then in the vastness of the sky, perchance we'll stretch up our hand held eye and toss it far into the void to seek the wonders of limitless space to future's hopes, perchance a distant star. Then held within future's hands and crafted thoughtful with care, a hand held eye will be tossed high to seek and find the start to all the glittering wonders. That fill our mind. Hopefully, I incorporated the two talks well. Thanks, Paul. Wonderful poem as always. Uh, next up is our is Dave Hoskin, and he will be doing the "What's Up in the January Skies" for us. Uh, while he's coming down, I'll let members know that. Uh, his January presentation that you'll see here today is also posted as a separate entity on our website. So you just have to go to the main page and you'll see what's up in the January skies. And uh, away we go. That's okay. They don't need to see me. Okay, so uh, what's up in the January skies? Hopefully uh, the weather will cooperate and we'll get some clearer skies uh, this month, uh, especially around the time of the uh, new moon, but uh, cross your fingers. Uh, next slide. So the sun this month, the days are getting longer um, at last. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, Sunset at the start of the month was at uh, 4.44 p.m. And uh, by the end of the month, it'll be at 5.21. So uh, not quite an, an hour's difference there. Um, similarly, uh, sunrise uh, is getting earlier. Um, so we're kind of, I think we're in the, I think of this as the sweet spot the next few months. So the nights are still fairly long and, and dark for observing. Uh, but we still we have some daylight and some sun, so we can make vitamin D and uh, mitigate seasonal affective disorder and all those other things that come from the the depths of winter. Uh, next slide, please. So the sun. This is a photo from spaceweather.com dot um, uh, that I pulled off the the web this morning and uh, just draw your attention to um, one particular sunspot uh, AR3182 so that's the one on the uh, on to the far left or on the uh, eastern coming around the eastern limb of the sun um, this is one to watch it's uh, quite a large sunspot it's already produced a couple x-class flares 
Uh, there's a 20% chance today that it would produce an X-class flare. Um, so it may, uh, if the weather cooperates and, and it uh, throws a coronal mass ejection our way as it rotates facing the earth, um, we may see some northern lights. Um, the other one to look at is, or keep in mind is uh, 3181. Uh, that one has uh, grown, uh, doubled in size over the last 24 hours, and it's also quite active. Uh, and as you can see, it's more or less facing us. Um, next slide, please. This is an interesting uh, video, um, which uh, from Space Weather, which shows the relative sizes of, of those two sunspots. But if you, if you watch 3181, you'll see that it's been getting bigger. Uh, next one, please. So sun's uh, getting quite interesting. If you have a solar filter, uh, if you made a filter at the Nova East, uh, and the, it looks like we got two more days of cloudy, uh, sunny with cloudy periods. So good chance to have a look at uh, our nearest star. Um, a few interesting things regarding the, uh, the moon. Um, so we, we just had a full moon, the Tom Cog spawning moon. Uh, and uh, moving into last quarter, on January 18th, the moon will be uh, very close to Antares. Um, so that'll, that'll be something to, uh, to see in the early morning if you're an early riser. Uh, on the 21st, uh, we'll have the new moon, the snow blinding moon. Um, and uh, soon after that, the moon will be near Jupiter. Uh, first quarter after at first quarter, um, very interesting, uh, easy way to find uh, Uranus. The moon will be very close to Uranus, uh, and I'll, I'll highlight that uh, in a minute when when we look at the planets. And then on the thirtieth, the moon will be near Mars. So it's kind of interesting. The start of the month, the moon ended up was near Uranus and Mars, and at the end of the month, it'll be near Uranus and Mars. And uh, the eighteenth. That's that's what you'll see if you look uh, in the uh, southeast, low in the southeast around 6 a.m. Um, and you can see the thin, uh, very thin uh, waning crescent moon, uh, very close to Antares. That'd be a, a, a nice photo op probably. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, two, uh, as I said, two things to look at uh, on the 28th and the 30th. Uh, and if you have the um, Celestron 15 by 70 binoculars, uh, this is, uh, they will frame uh, uh, the views very nicely. Um, both, uh, you'll, have, you'll get Uranus and the Moon in the same view on the 28th, and the Moon and Mars in the same view on the 30th, but a 4.4 degree field of view. Um, this is simulated through Stellarium. Uh, as uh, always, the best time to uh, check out um, features on the moon around the Terminator. Uh, you'll you'll see them most of them around first quarter on the twenty eighth, and uh, a number of them are uh, required seeing if you're working on your uh, Explore the Universe uh, certificate. Next slide, please. And. Um, Lunar X and the Lunar V uh, will be visible on the 28th uh, uh, for us in Halifax around 8.37 p.m. Um, you'll be able to see these features on the lunar surface uh, created by the uh, sunlight touching the tops of, of uh, some uh, raised areas around, around different craters. And uh, I got this from the, the dates. Lisa Ann uh, posted a, a very helpful uh, um, year year long chart showing the the times when the, the lunar X and the V will be visible. So thanks to that, thanks Lisa. Uh, the planets in January. Mercury begins very low in the western sky, uh, and in the evening, and it very quickly fades. Um, so by middle of the month, you won't be able to see it, but then by mid month, it'll reappear in the morning sky. Um, and uh, 
on January 30th, that'll be your best time to see Mercury uh, because uh, its greatest western elongation of 25 degrees will take place. So it's going to be furthest from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> and and if you want to, people in Zoom land, if you want to see the uh, slides that I've already gone through, just go to the Rask Halifax website and the uh, presentations there is a, is a PDF. Sorry, good, Dave. Okay, so uh, as I said, Mercury, um, have a look uh, for Mercury t at the end of the month. Um, it'll uh, be, uh, it, it, you have to be an early riser, but it'll be uh, uh, fairly high for Mercury um, on, the, uh, on the 30th of January. Uh, Venus is low in the southwest in the evening sky, uh, climbing to a four degree, 24 degree elongation by the end of the month. And there's a close conjunction uh, with Saturn on January 22nd. Mars, I'm sure everyone's noticed it, uh, still bright and high in the evening sky, uh, still well worth uh, observing and taking pictures of. And uh, on the 12th of January, there's a nice uh, photo op for uh, um, people that are interested in wider field imaging. Uh, the Mars will be uh, situated between the Pleiades and the Hyades. Uh, and it will uh, begin to dim, uh, fading to a magnitude uh, minus 0.3 by the end of the month um, as it uh, uh, moves farther away from the Earth, uh, op opposition having uh, taken place uh, uh, earlier in, earlier in uh, December. Jupiter uh, is uh, in the twilight uh, sky in the south-southwest. And on the 25th, I've mentioned, it'll be close to the crescent moon. Saturn uh, is uh, pretty hard to see. It's uh, very low in the early evening sky, and uh, by the end of the month, it'll it'll be lost into twilight. Uh, but before then, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to see its uh, close approach to Venus. Uh, Uranus is uh, uh, high in the evening sky, so chance to see Uranus. It's in Aries. Um, and if uh, you know where to look and it's dark enough, uh, the unaided eye uh, will be able to uh, pick out Uranus. Uranus. Uh, Neptune, you need binoculars or a telescope to see, uh, but it is in the uh, extreme uh, northeast part of Aquarius. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what you, you should look for um, uh, just after sunset on the 22nd of January. Um, that's the conjunction of Saturn and Venus, very, very close together. Uh, would be, I think it'll be, because Venus is so much brighter than Saturn, it may be difficult to get a good picture of, of the two together showing the, the features, uh, but you could, you could do a composite. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, almost new moon uh, will also be visible very, very low, a very, very thin crescent. Uh, so, and, and you're going to look, be looking in Capricornus. Next slide, please. Next slide, Dave. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so th this is what I mentioned to, to you want to look at uh, on around uh, the 30th, if it's clear, um, you see how the, uh, the moon uh, is, uh, sitting um, between Mars and the Pleiades and the Hyades are just, just below. So that's a really, a really nice wide field image. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have the uh, Quadronated uh, meteor shower coming up. Uh, well, actually it's already happened uh, and it was cloudy January 3rd, 4th. So we didn't, wouldn't have seen it. We probably didn't miss much. Um, Normally, the shower gives us about 120 meteors per hour at its peak, but there was a near. There's been a nearly fully illuminated moon. I had the full moon last night, and uh, the previous nights it was pretty bright too. So only the brighter meteors would have uh, been available so, uh, visible. But anyone that did have clear skies, hopefully they saw a few fireballs. Anyway, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is something to point out that in my uh, montage, I showed a, a, an image from G BGO that uh, um, Dave Chapman had requested. 
and this is the ZTF, and you, you can see its uh, its path uh, through the night sky, and it, it's it's getting higher. So, be close to uh, by the end of the month, uh, fairly close to so in between Ursa uh, Minor and Draco, uh, and it should be quite bright. Um, so something to put in your your observing calendars. Uh, see if you can. You should be able to easily see it with binoculars, and as I said, it may get bright enough to be seen with the unaided eye. On uh, um, the start of February, it'll it'll be at its closest approach to Earth, uh, 0.28 uh, astronomical units, with an estimated magnitude of 7.3. So just on the 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 border of uh, visibility, the unaided eye at, at a dark site. But I, I have seen some predictions that it might reach magnitude six. So we'll just have to see. Comets are, are pretty unpredictable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so for Explore the Universe, winter constellations. Uh, these are um, six constellations to uh, to uh, seek out and, uh, and document your observing. So Auriga, Gemini, Taurus, Orion, Canis Major and Canis uh, Minor, uh, all seen looking towards the uh, south uh, southeast. Next slide, please. Uh, winter stars, um, brightest star in the night sky for us, uh, Sirius, is uh, very prominent uh, uh, in in, uh, in a clear sky now, uh, relatively low, uh, sitting just below uh, Orion the Hunter, uh, and it's worth. Uh, learning to uh, pick out these particular stars because they're used for uh, sin scan al alignments for those of you that have a uh, sky watcher uh, built uh, next slide please uh some deep sky objects um there's two of them to uh highlight uh, this month uh one is uh, kemble's cascade which is an asterism um very, very uh, striking and, and beautiful uh, asterism uh, in uh, even in binoculars. And if you have a telescope, you can zoom in on a open cluster at the bottom of the cascade, uh, NGC 1502. It's pretty hard to miss the great nebula in Orion, uh, even in the city. Uh, you can pick it out uh, with the unaided eye. And uh, the challenge is uh, to see if you can use your uh, instruments, your your teleco telescopes, to pick out the six stars that uh, are are um, can be can be set, uh, split uh, in the trapezium. Uh, so it, it's pretty easy to see uh, A, B, C, and D. Uh, e and F are challenges. So have, have a look at the the tra trapezium next time you uh, look at Orion. Uh, double stars, uh, Delta Cephei is uh, an interesting one. It's one of the double stars uh, to seek out in the Explore the Universe program. It's a Cepheid variable star prototype. So uh, this is the uh, star upon which a lot of uh, distances, uh, Cepheid variables are, are used to calculate the uh, uh, galactic dif uh, distances uh, within the, uh, the galaxy. Uh, it has a period of 5.4 days and uh, quite a, a pretty star. The Delta A, Delta Cephei A is uh, a white yellow star, and Delta uh, Cephei uh, C is a blue star. And uh, I took this photo, it was taken uh, not by myself, but by uh, another amateur astronomer, and it was uh, posted on online. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you're looking still on the topic of variable stars, uh, Algol, the demon star, um, on at the end of the month on the twenty, this is a you can see the the star go from its uh, maxima to minima and maxima again, um, all in one night, and still get to bed uh, before two in the morning. Um, so again, if it's a clear sky, worth looking at. Uh, another variable star. Um, so, the, so the uh, algal, the demon star, has a has a 
goes from um, maximum to minima in about over about three and a half hours. Um, so it's an easy one. Uh, another variable star, a Mira type variable star is Heinz Crimson, uh, Crimson Star in, uh, which is a carbon star. Uh, and it varies uh, considerably uh, in brightness from magnitude of 5.5 to 11.7, um, but it takes many, many years to see that change. I don't remember exactly how, how many years, but it, it was a long time. Uh, next slide, Dave. And that's it for what's up in January skies. Are there any questions? Thanks, David. So hopefully uh, the curse of the concrete skies are over. Uh, we've minimized over the coming month, um, which soon leads us to the next session, which is our Christmas goodies and why we have concrete skies. The term concrete skies, as you can appreciate, is in reference to the grayness that we keep seeing up there at night. Uh, varying grayness, but never do we, or very seldom do we see the stars, the moon, and other things that we would truly like to see. So I leave the floor open for members to describe something that they received at Christmas time from the floor um, or those in Zoom land, just let us know and uh, we will go from there. Anyone here in the room have something they'd like to share? We'll start here. Uh, David does. He's got to back down. Okay, so as I said, uh, these weren't uh, Christmas presents per se, uh, unless they were Christmas presents to myself. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was worth pointing out. Uh, a couple of books I, I uh, purchased. This one um, is a really neat one. Uh, the a fully illustrated history of the moon. And uh, basically it, uh, it's a bunch of uh, kind of one page, um, I wouldn't say call their chapters, but uh, uh, you know, one page highlights of the uh, roles the, the moon has played in um, understanding our place in the universe uh, from the dawn of civilization and looking forward uh, to the uh, possible colonies on the moon. Uh, and, and I liked it because it was a, kind of easy reading i could i could read a read a few snippets every night before going to bed um the other one is this uh 100 things to see in the night sky um which is a really nice book it's it's by uh an astronomer uh dean regis who's an astronomer for the uh, cincinnati observatory and uh really a fun read um so he goes through um planets, the sun, the moon, but then he focuses on uh, northern hemisphere constellations and uh, talks about gives uh, talks about the stories associated with the different constellations and the different stars. And, and again, a very, very, very enjoyable read. Um, for, you know, for example, at the section on Orion the Hunter, and then talking about the stars the major stars that make up Orion, uh, Betelgeuse, and Bellatrix, and uh, Rigel, and the Nebula. Uh, so highly recommended. Uh, I think both are available on Amazon if, if you're interested. Well, I guess maybe I was one of the reasons why the skies are gray, because um, I have a very generous husband who did give me something for Christmas. Uh, this year, and it's a Spaboni um, eyepiece that has three to eight times zoom, which I have, as you can appreciate, have not had the opportunity to even utilize yet. Um, it certainly will be over, it can't, I can't use it with my 80 ED, 80 ED Evo Star, um, but I can use it potentially with my 10 inch uh, Mead SCT and Fingers crossed, even with my six inch Dobsonian. So I'm looking forward to that. Three to, sorry, three to eight millimeters is the range of the uh, focal of the uh, magnification. 
So um, maybe I'll be able to f to see the trapezium with this um, on, with the 10 inch and um, some of the uh, really cool features that perhaps Tim Doucette has been able to see with whatever he's using. I might be able to see some of that with this once the bank's once I'm able to use it. Um, so looking forward to that. So I thank my husband for this. Just got to pray to the sky gods that uh, the astronomy gods that we get uh, some clear skies to, to utilize it with. Anyone else in the room have anything to, uh, to present? How about in Zoom land? Nothing there. Okay. Well, with that in mind, thank everyone for attending those out in Zoom land. I hope to see you next month and those here. Um, sorry. I will. Okay. Uh, yes. Thanks, Dave. Dave just reminded me if uh, John Angreaves, if you have video and audio, if you would like to say a few words, if you have that functioning for you. Just um, well, thank you all for, um, of course, first nominating me and then uh, electing me. Um, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great experience being with RASC. So um, it's kind of an honor to be um, here at the top to uh, represent the uh, the center. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, oh. <laughs> There he is, finally. <laughs> That's what our president looks like, folks. <laughs> um, so welcome, John, again, um, in that role. To conclude today, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to join us uh, on our very first Youth Day. Thank you especially to Silas Eastwood and to Nathan Elner Masselman for their presentations today. Uh, Mind-blowing, both of them. Uh, and also to our three IT guys who've made this possible to us today, Dave Lane, Jerry Black, and Bob Russell. So I thank you. Um, we're still working on the bugs, as you can see, uh, and here, um, but hopefully over the next couple of months, we will have these all worked out and all will be well. Our next meeting is Saturday, February 4th. So we hope to see you then. In the meantime, um, keep in touch and Remember, starting at your feet, look up. Bye now. <laughs>